To me, every semester before the pandemic broke, I have to explain a lot to students and to faculty and to, and to the people that collaborate with us that we are not your standard class on how to build a startup, that we don't really care. Actually, I personally don't care. I've built startups myself. Uh, I think it's a tough thing to do. If you do it, you need to be convinced there is no other way. And I don't buy into this whole celebration of let's do more startups. So I don't think I'm teaching the same class year over year. My class is rigorously made. I spend a lot of time coming up with projects, working with students, coming up with uh, the content and update the content every semester. And every year I meet a different cohort of students. So from the outside, people that do not educate often or that you know just see education from afar, think that we're just like sort of a parrot that repeats the same content year on year. That's nowhere close to the reality. And it's not just like a tap on the back saying, hey, we'll work a lot. No, no, it's not that. It's like students change so much from one year to the next that you cannot take absolutely anything for granted. My job is not repeating stuff. My job is to cause, to provoke thought and fight the resistance from students in a way, in a sort of a, think of it as a sparing game, right? Students come to the class wanting to learn, right? But at the same time, they think they already know. And this happens to them and it happens to me when I go to a classroom, right? So it's not that it's a problem with, I don't think it's a problem, it's just the way we humans learn. We need to encounter content that feels counterintuitive and fight it a bit. So my role isn't just expose content. My job is to create that, that moment in which they spar with the content. You know, a lot of what I teach, a lot of what I wrote about in my book, a lot about bringing technology to the world is understanding how to work with what you have. So in my class, we take technology to the world by not simply assuming that the technology is already a product, but trying to figure out the following. Oh, look, now we know how to do that. What problem is out there in the world that we could solve now that we know how to do that thing there? So it's not simply pushing technology. It's not simply assuming someone else knows what to do or that someone knows that it's not. It's like a massive problem solving at a large scale with real technologies. So there I find myself at the beginning of the semester saying, how do this kind of massive problem solving here with what I have at my home so that they see me uh, as if I was there with them or at least better. So it started by, you know, the simple stuff, which is hooking up the screen so I can separate the class list from their persons, from whatever other notes I may have over there. And that helped then get good sound. Uh, then, and this kind of evolved as we started teaching. It's not like I had the perfect idea from the get-go. So screens came first, a good mic came next. Uh, then I realized I didn't want to ever again have to share slides on Zoom because everything disappeared. The whole world disappeared when you share something on Zoom. And then I, you start to have to search for faces. Where did these people go, right? It's a very strange environment. So uh, I found another way to present, which I can, uh, I can show you. Um, it's very silly. And it's now you have the, the luxury of being able to see the latest version of this. So let me first get, that, get rid of my forest so that it doesn't interfere, right? We'll get it back later. So the second thing is, you know, what I can do is show you slides in the following way. And this took a whole semester to figure out. I can show you slides like this. Now, this is in a loop. I talk about my class and my stuff. I can point to them. And I have the beautiful idea of showing you slides the way Harry Potter saw magic move around. And sure, now I could create a whole new setup that's not as complex as mine because I've learned how to do it that way. As we did that, I also used the own setup as a means to explain to my students how you actually go about innovating. It's not about this fantastic new idea. It's not what you hear about this fantastic page and people with clairvoyance. It's literally you start with what you have and a problem that's not even clear to you at the outset. So the whole class became in a way an exercise in what we teach. And, uh, and it could have backfired, it kind of worked. And the interactivity came to us in, in these ways. Like uh, the moment you see me do silly stuff, you don't feel as concerned as saying something uh, to others. The moment you see that I see you in a big size, it feels like more invigorating to you than seeing me like bored looking at you like this or whatever. And as I see me walking and my voice projects, they too get the sense that there is something going on that's not just, we're not just waiting for the new normal, we just created the new one. The first week of class, I, 
which is a week in which I learned how I needed to amp my game to be able to serve this semester, I also realized that I had no means to truly evaluate the class the way I did every other semester. And I had to think about two things separately. One is, did students learn, right? And the other one is, how do we grade that? And it's a tricky question because I, would not, I was not going to be capable of knowing until we were done how far we would go into the content. So there was another layer of uncertainty there. So what I did, both for assessments and so on, is I told students the following. First, this is a joint endeavor. We're all going to learn how this gets taught and gets learned in remote. So I engaged them as partners. I even asked one of them every, every week to become my unofficial teaching assistant, only so they could see what was going on and tell me about problems. I kept the channel open 24 seven with students to, for them to kind of send me comments about the class, questions, or even like, you know, this the last week, we forgot about this, but you know, the fall of 2020 was horrible in so many ways, right? And, and stressful in so many ways that half the way through the semester, everybody was lost. Fortunate because I had built this connection with students. I realized that and so I added lots of signposts along the way for him, them to come back to, to our reality and our, our flow. So that partnership paid off. The other thing we did is we changed all the assignments. So what used to be assignments, I figured, you know what, I didn't really want people working more from home. The whole idea of homework felt a bit absurd. Uh, everything was homework, right? So, so we went on and we started, um, I created practice sheets out of every prior assignment and created different lectures where we, every 20 minutes we changed the activity and we discussed these things. Then you, you might say, well, what about grading? Well, I, said, I don't really care that much about grading. Grading is a thing we have to do. It's not the core of education. The core of education is learning, right? So what we said is, you know, instead of grading and cross grading, I created a different kind of rubric, which I announced to students ahead of time about how we were going to do it. But instead that I said, what would have been me alone grading every one of these with teaching assistants and graders and so on. Now it's going to be each of us discussing in very minute settings, like three or four people at a time, how the other people face the same assignment. And I did that every week. It became the practice sheet was they did it in their teams. They discussed with other teams how they had faced it. And then we discussed one of them, all of us in class. So every assignment that would have been a lonely thing became the core of the interaction. That's one thing. Then what, what about the content? Well, I pushed as much, much content as I could onto the web. Anything that could be read was on the web in Canvas. So I used Canvas as sort of live updates of content. I ignored every other feature of it. Uh, uh, so of course I still conveyed the content that was always on their examples. It was always through discussion. As the semester went on, my daughter, who's uh, 11, not 12 now, said, could we show this in my school? And I said, okay, so let's figure this out. So now fast forward to the end of the semester. Uh, we created this event, 300 uh, middle schoolers uh, connected via Zoom, all the faculty of that middle school connected via Zoom, and we prepared my students to do two minute presentations. Now, but this is not a pitch, right? Better yet, no one's posing as presenting to investors because there's no investors in the room, there's just people. The people that will actually get to benefit from this 10 years down the road, right? So how do you tell these people how awesome it is technology? How great is it that you can actually solve problems with it? How is it that they're planning on doing it? And how do you do it in a manner that sixth, seventh, and eighth graders could actually understand and ask questions? And how do you engage those sixth and seventh, eighth graders afterwards in asking questions, feeling empowered? So this is the way it worked out this year. Uh, my students did a phenomenal job. They actually boiled down the essence to two minutes. And I told them, you cannot give up on real technology. So this is not about wishy-washy, you could do this or you would do that. No, 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 this got to be real, right? Second, don't dumb it down. These are simply young, they're not dumb. So explain it to them in a manner that you would to a person that's just learning, right? And they care to know about this. And the third thing I told them is that um, this needs to be a percentage of something you would care about doing, not something that you think uh, investors would like. So this became the most genuine final presentations of my class in all years. My students felt, oh my God, this is the way we should present technologies all the time. So I said, well, then do it, <laughs> right? Do it this way. That's why you come to MIT to learn how to truly use technology as this kind of um, force for good, right? Sure, we can also make money of it, absolutely. Doing good and doing well at the same time, right? The students in the middle of school were 
uplifted by this, um, this presentation because they got to see technologists. Maybe they understood some of it, maybe not, but it was for them. So they, and they were allowed to ask questions and they inundated us with, with questions. So a lot of people think that advancing the state of the art is just about research and then we somehow educate. But you know, what this pandemic has taught us or reminded us is something that's very unique to MIT and how we think about MIT. And I'm so glad I have a chance to kind of say this out loud because it may not have been said so much in the last recent years, which is that we also advance the state of the art by finding, finding ways to make it more accessible to our students. And MIT has an incredibly long tradition of phenomenal educators. Patrick Winston, who passed away recently, was a dear friend, um, uh, Paul Penfield Jr., and even more so that you could go in the back in, in, in history that made it a point to advance the state of the art by becoming amazing teachers, right? And then by making things more accessible, understanding them themselves better, and in so doing, coming up with incredibly new ideas and thinking of knowledge as a tool. So that's the tradition of MIT, and this pandemic has caused me to remember that.